Well, we're starting this new sermon series today called Love Stories, and I've looked forward to it because I, one of the ways that I describe the Bible is as a love story from God, or a love letter uh, from God. There are a lot of ways to look at the Bible, and uh, people can get confused about it, but I think if you look at the Bible as really God's revelation of God's love for us, that makes sense. So we're going to be looking at really important stories and scriptures about God's love for us and our love for God. We're not going to be talking about David and Bathsheba or Samson and Delilah. We're going to be talking about God. And this particular story today, we're going to read the story of the prodigal son, is arguably the greatest and most important story in the New Testament. And I'll explain why. I want to introduce a word to you. You don't need to remember this word, but I'd like for you to remember the concept. Hermeneutics, that's a theological word. It is the, the study uh, of uh, interpretation of the Bible. It's how we, uh, they call it the science of interpretation. Biblical theologians use hermeneutics as a way to figure out what the, what the Bible means and how it fits together. So you don't need to worry about the word hermeneutics, but you might be somebody that says, look, I just read the Bible, I don't, don't worry too much about interpreting it. But if you were to read the Bible a lot, you might start finding the need to interpret a little bit. For instance, if you read the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, you might read through there and say, hmm, I think that might be two creation stories rather than one creation story. And if you did, you would be in agreement with every Jewish and Christian theologian who ever read those stories in the original Hebrew, by the way. Or you might read Matthew and Luke, the Christmas stories, and say these stories aren't exactly the same. How do I fit them together? And so it's important for us to have a way of making sense um, out of those times when the Bible doesn't necessarily fit together really well. So I'm going to share with you my own hermeneutic part of it. And that is that the words of Jesus always take precedence. So if you compare the words of Jesus, say, to the words of a minor prophet, we're going to interpret the minor prophet through the words of Jesus rather than the other way around. And then there are certain stories which are so powerful and so full of truth that we say these are the stories that should stand guard over our theology, that we're going to interpret the other stories in the Bible through the lens of this particular story. Um, and that's just a really important way of approaching the Bible and having a, a full understanding of God's love for us. There are three questions. I was going to add this much. Three questions you can ask about every scripture you read. The first one is, what does it say about us as human beings? The second question is, what does it say about God? And the third question is, what does it say about the relationship between human beings and God. And by those three standards, those three questions, there is no story that is more powerful than the one we're going to read today. The prodigal son, Luke 15. Then Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. Some translations read a far country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. I read through several translations of this. Some say uh, through wild living, you know, or through immoral living. It doesn't, it doesn't actually say that he squandered his money on gambling and prostitutes. But that might be one of the ways in which you squandered your property in dissolute living. Just in case you didn't know that. <laughs> when he had spent everything, now pay attention to this because it's important. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country. That was something he didn't have control over. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. And he would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, that's an interesting phrase. It's probably happened to you 
He said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus had a habit of telling very shocking stories. Frankly, if you've grown up in the church or if you've been in the church for a while and you've done a little bit of reading in the Bible, you've probably read those stories enough that they've, they've lost the shock element for you. But let me just give you an example. Jesus once told a story about a Samaritan who was going down the road and he crossed the road in order to give aid and help to a Jew, to become a neighbor to a Jew. And you and I have read that story about the Good Samaritan for so long that we kind of water it down. Yeah, we should be nice, kind to one another. We should help out one another. But those who heard that story for the first time were shocked, shocked at the idea that a Samaritan would cross the road to give aid to a Jew. And then the story today, there are other examples. We're going to go straight to the story today. The story today, the story of the prodigal son. If Jesus had been trying to create the most inflammatory, provocative story he could possibly dream up, this was it. Because he tells a story about a, a farmer, evidently a well-to-do, respected man, who has two sons, and the younger son comes and asks him for his inheritance early. The moment Jesus said that, the people who were listening to him were literally shocked and offended for two reasons. One is that the younger son would never inherit. In that particular time and place, in that culture, the younger son didn't get an inheritance at all. It doesn't read that way, but that's, that's what happened. The younger son claimed that he had an inheritance coming from his father. And so they were shocked at that. But the second thing that was shocking at all is that either of the sons would ask their father for the inheritance. Because in that culture, to ask for your inheritance meant that you wished your father to be dead. It not, might not be so shocking to us. Both of my sons have already asked for their inheritance. But for them, this was a statement. And so if, if Jesus had been trying to paint a picture of a sinner whose sins were so egregious that they were unforgivable, he could not have done a better job. A son who claims uh, the, a part of inheritance that wouldn't even be his in the first place, and a son who goes to his father and says, Father, I wish you were dead. Give me everything that is yours. Die to me so that I might have your money. He was a wise father. He knew that he could not demand or command or force the love of his son. And as we will see, the love of his son was all he cared about. He didn't care about the work from his son. He didn't care about loyalty from his son. He just wanted the love of his son. More than anything else, he wanted to love his son. So he knew he couldn't force it. So it's one of the great themes in the Bible from, from Genesis on. The father grants freedom. You get this. The father is God, right? The father grants total freedom to the son and hands him his half of the inheritance. And the son takes off down the road and winds up in what the New Testament calls a far country, a distant country. We don't know where he went. We don't know what he did. Jesus told stories. Jesus had the knack of brevity. I like brevity. I, I don't think any of us are smart enough to, to preach for a long time. I don't think I've ever preached 30 minutes in my life. So I like brevity. But sometimes I uh, uh, marvel at how brief Jesus was in the telling of his stories. And I wonder about some of the details that maybe we don't know. And so I wonder about this son. When we read the story, he just looks like a total loser. Like he goes to the far country, spends his money, in fact, on booze and prostitutes, throws it away. But I think that may not be the case. I think maybe the boy was ambitious. That maybe he had a vision for himself, a vision for his life. 
There's no doubt that he'd committed the sins of, of disrespect for his father. Thou shalt not, thou shalt love thy father and mother. Thou shalt respect thy mother and father. That he was greedy, that he was prideful, that he was narcissistic. No doubt about all of those sins. And yet I, I wonder if it wasn't the case that when he got to the far country, he had plans. Maybe a little startup company. An internet company of some kind. Artificial intelligence, that's big. Maybe he had hopes and dreams of starting a company, but what we know is that everything fell apart. Because this, this is what happened. The, Jesus did give us this, this detail. The economy fell apart. The way, the way they put it in those days was a famine occurred in the country. The way you and I would say it is that we went into a, a bust cycle. The stock market fell. Leverage loans were called. Unemployment soared along with inflation. And suddenly, this boy was in a foreign country alone, and he had no money. In order to survive, he hired himself out to a local farmer, a pig farmer, and he came to this point where he was on his knees thinking about eating the food of the pigs because he was so hungry. And it was a moment that changed his life forever. Driven to his knees, he realized that he was not just poor and hungry, but that he was broken. That he was broken on the inside. Let's make sure we understand what this is all about. This is the alcoholic or the drug addict who hits rock bottom. This is the anxious person who has a mental breakdown. This is the depressed person who contemplates suicide. This is the gambler who has lost it all and has no place to go. He comes to that point where he's not just out of money, he's out of all of those inner resources that keep us going. He knows he is broken on the inside. Some of you know I ride horses. I still ride, don't, not very much these days, but I still ride when I get an opportunity to do so. A few years ago, I was riding a bay gilding in a small arena in Frisco that had hard packed ground. And we were loping in a left circle. This gilding was nearly blind in his left eye. At least that's the excuse I give him. As we came around one corner, something scared him. I think he saw something that left eye, and he took a huge jump to the right. He was, he was quick and he was powerful. Doesn't mean I shouldn't have ridden, him, have, have ridden him, but I didn't. I fell off of him. And I hit the ground pretty hard. When I got up, I, I knew I was hurt. But I found my horse, and just for good measure, I got back on him and rode him around for a few minutes. Then I unsaddled him, 40 pound, I ride 40 pound saddles, I unsaddled him and I got in my truck and I drove to Plano to the emergency room. I, I was in quite a bit of pain and I remember that because uh, at one point I pulled over from off the North Dallas toll road because I thought I was going to pass out. But I eventually made it to the emergency room and I remember when I walked in Everybody staring at me. I was in pain. It never occurred to me. I didn't think about it. Everybody was staring at me. And then I realized that they were staring at my boots. And I looked down and I, I thought, okay, this is the first time they've ever seen anybody in an emergency room in Plano, Texas, wearing boots and spurs. <laughs> if it had been Alpine or Mule Shoe, it wouldn't have been anything. Almost everybody in the emergency room in Alpine or Mule Shoe, right, uh, have on boots and spurs. But they'd never seen anybody in boots and spurs and a cowboy hat. They finally got me back to a doctor, and, and the doctor said, what's wrong with you? And I said, well, I think I bruised a rib. And I remember he looked at me and smiled at me in this kind of funny, it was um, a really funny kind of way. I, I've never known exactly what he meant by that smile, whether he didn't believe me or was making fun of me or what. 
But after a while, they took me back to the x-ray machine. You know the drill. 45 minutes later, he reappears and he's got the x-rays. He says, Mr. Underwood, uh, our x-ray machine isn't working really well right now. So I'm not sure how many of your ribs are broken or how many of them are bruised, but I can tell you that you either broke or bruised every single rib on the left side of your body. That's when I learned the usefulness there is a usefulness for Vicodin. <laughs> the truth of the matter is that he didn't need to tell me that. When I hit the ground, I heard a <laughs> snapping sound like wood breaking. I already knew that there was something on the inside of me that was broken. And we've all been there, haven't we, most of us? Sooner or later, you get to that place. You see, as I've thought about that incident, it has occurred to me that we rarely go to the ground, to our knees on our own. When we find ourselves on the ground on our knees, it's almost always because life has driven us there. Driven us to that point where we have to admit that maybe there's something on the inside that is broken. That's what happened to this boy in the far country. It doesn't make any difference how he spent his money, how he lost his fortune, what he did or didn't do. It doesn't make any difference how many sins he committed in the far country. In that moment, he found himself on his knees and he knew that there was something on the inside that was broken. And he arrived at this remarkable conclusion that he couldn't fix what was broken on the inside without repairing what was broken on the outside. And that was his relationship with his father and his brother and his friends. And so it is a remarkable and dramatic moment when we see him rise and begin the journey back home. And he has been humbled. It is clear that he's been humbled because he doesn't expect much. He expects to find a vengeful and angry father and he begins to rehearse his homecoming speech. Father, I know I have sinned against you and against God. If you'll only let me come back and be a servant to you for the rest of my life, I will never complain. And so here's the question I want to ask you before we read the rest of the story. Do you believe that the Father forgave him? You don't have to raise your hands. Just think about it. Do you believe the Father forgave him? The Father for uttered words of forgiveness. Son, I understand. I forgive you. Read very carefully. So he set off and he went to his father. But while he was still far, while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. Do you think the father had been running to the road every night, looking down the road to see if his son had returned? While he was still far off, do you think the father maybe went to the door of his home every evening and shouted, come home, son, come home? While he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and love. And the father ran to him and put his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You're not going to see any words of forgiveness because it's not what the father had on his mind. The father only had love on his mind. The father said to his slaves, quickly, Bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Maybe you were raised in a time and place where you were taught that when you were in the far country, when you were in those places, 
where you were lost, that there would be a vengeful and angry God waiting for you. Maybe you were taught that when that moment comes, the Greek word for it in the New Testament is metanoia. So when that moment no, comes that you know you must turn around and start a new direction and you head back home. Maybe you were taught that there you would find a God who would demand penance from you. An angry and vengeful God. This story is the story that should stand guard over all of our theology. It should stand guard over all of the ways in which we think about God. This story is the greatest story ever told. This story is the greatest love story ever told. It tells us about a God who wants but one thing from you and me, a God that simply wants us to come home.